The meeting at the Kremlin was dubbed another step in the normalization of relations. They are two of the most important players on the global stage. And the relationship between Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Russian President Vladimir Putin has never been straightforward. Diplomatic ties all but collapsed in November 2015 when Turkish forces shot down a Russian warplane that briefly flew into its territory. It was further rocked in December last year by the dramatic murder of the Russian ambassador to Turkey. The statesmen will sit down together to try and repair relations and at the heart of discussions is likely to be the war in Syria. The parties have spoken in support of the World Society uniting efforts in fighting terrorism. We have stated that due to the active role of Turkey and Russia, we managed not only to reach a ceasefire between Syrian troops and the armed opposition, but also to start direct talks between the fighting parties in the capital of Kazakhstan, Astana. Finding a solution to the Syrian crisis wasn't the only item discussed. This was also a high-level cooperation council meeting, and a total of eight agreements were also signed between the two sides mostly aimed at paving the way to improving economic ties, which had dipped to 10-year lows. Our expectation is to maintain reciprocal trust and expand dialogue on a political level on the economy. Therefore, we expect Russia to completely lift economic restrictions. That is the only way to achieve our $100 billion trade target. Putin and Erdogan also discussed the implementation of key joint energy projects due to begin soon. The partnership on energy between Turkey and Russia is one of a kind. This process continues to increase with oil and natural gas. Works like Turkish Stream, as well as the Akayu nuclear power plant, continue within the context of this normalization process. Some Middle East experts say such coordination could be crucial for liberating cities like Manbij and defeating terrorists in the provinces of Idlib and Homs in Syria. I hope we may to organize mutual operation. A good example it is mil military uh, cooperation in Al-Bab in Barbab because Russian air forces support Turkish troops. The Turkish army has pounded positions of Syrian soldiers in the flashpoint Syrian city of Manbij. A uh, Syrian military source said the shelling targeted border guards attack claimed lives of several people and wounded many others. And this comes as Syrian army units backed by Air Force carried out special operations killing several militants and destroying supply routes of Al-Nusra front terrorists in the countryside of Hama and Idlib. Meanwhile, Turkey is alarmed as Washington deployed Marines in Syria and pledged to use Kurdish forces in the fight against Daesh in Raqqa. Turkey strongly opposes U.S. plans, saying this will negatively affect bilateral ties. The Syrian government has called on the United Nations to force Turkey into leaving the Arab country's territory. In a letter to the world body and the head of the U.N. Security Council, Syria's foreign ministry accused Turkey of supporting terror groups and said Ankara is responsible for the deaths of thousands of Syrian citizens. The letter says Turkey has destroyed Syria's infrastructure upon direct orders from Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Damascus has also demanded the UN live up to its obligations to force Turkish troops out of Syrian territory and help end the violation of the country's sovereignty. Turkey has deployed its forces in northern Syria where they are supporting militant groups. Iran's ambassador to International Atomic Energy Agency says Israel's nuclear weapons are a threat to global peace. Reza Najafi made the remarks during a meeting with the IAEA Board of Governors. He called on the agency to take Tel Aviv's nuclear program into serious consideration. Najafi further criticized the Israeli regime for ignoring the international outcry against its development of a military-based nuclear program. Israel is widely believed to possess nuclear hundreds of nuclear warheads and has not signed the non-proliferation treaty. Tel Aviv's Western allies, led by the U.S., have on several occasions voted down IAEA resolutions that demand the inspection of Israel's nuclear weapons sites. And President Trump also faces a long list of growing, growing foreign policy challenges from the Middle East to Asia. And as George Thomas reports, the latest missile tests by rogue nations North Korea and Iran are only complicating and making matters worse. Coming soon to a theater in Iran, Battle of the Persian Gulf 2. The new animated film by an Iranian director depicts an epic battle between the United States and Iran. In one scene, 
an Iranian officer launches a missile at a U.S. Navy ship in the Persian Gulf. Seconds later, the vessel explodes into a huge ball of fire, sinking it. The film's director told Reuters, I hope that the film shows Trump how American soldiers will face a humiliating defeat if they attack Iran. The movie is another reminder of tensions that are brewing in the region. Iran has been conducting missile tests with the country's Revolutionary Guards, successfully testing a naval missile that can be used against targets some 100 miles away, targets that include U.S. ships. And another rogue country, North Korea, also continues to test the new administration in Washington. The communist regime carried out its fifth nuclear test and launched several missiles in recent days. The global community needs to understand every country is in danger from the actions of North Korea. Adding to the peninsula's political instability, South Korea, a strong U.S. ally and key trading partner, removed its president from power following corruption charges. Protests have erupted on the streets of Seoul as the country prepares to elect a new leader. More provocation from the rogue nation of North Korea as new reports surface that Pyongyang is preparing for its next nuclear test. Days after launching four missiles, what is the latest that we know about these so-called preparations now by North Korea? Yeah, concerning stuff, Shannon. The reports come from a reliable U.S.-based North Korea think tank that we have used extensively in the past. They are looking at satellite imagery just taken over the past 24 hours or so, and they are seeing activity, as we have seen in the past, at a site in North Korea where testing has occurred, a sign in their words that Pyongyang could conduct a new nuclear test at short notice. The regime of Kim Jong-un has detonated two devices last year. There were three prior to that, each increasing in capability, each also working at building up the storehouse of nuclear material. The regime is now capable of building something like 25 bombs, according to experts. This is the testing, as you noted, of missiles continues that aimed at carrying a nuclear warhead. In addition to the ones that were launched this week, there were a dozen ballistic missiles last year. Missiles getting closer to hitting the United States. All of this activity, Shannon, banned by the United Nations. Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte threatened to put Mindanao under martial law if officials don't work harder to fight criminal activity. In his meeting with local government units on March 9th, Duterte asked local officials to help him keep the peace in Mindanao. Duterte said only local government officials can keep terrorism, criminality, and illegal drugs from worsening. He urged them to be more proactive in fighting those issues by using their power to supervise the police and ensuring peace and stability. Duterte emphasized that he doesn't want to reach the point of having to declare martial law and stripping local officials of their power, but if he does, it may, quote, last for 20 days or for one year. In September last year, Duterte declared a state of lawlessness nationwide after a bombing in a night market in Davao killed 14 people and injured 67 others. In a bid for Tokyo to hold the 2020 Olympic Games, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe promised to ensure the environmental safety of Japan in 2013. Let me assure you, the situation is under control. But the level of nuclear radiation detected recently at Reactor 2 at the Fukushima No. 1 nuclear power plant was deadly. Based on pictures taken by TAPCO robots that entered the vessel of the reactor, the radiation level inside reached 650 servers per hour. A brief exposure to that would easily kill a person. The top priority is transparent information. Tourists have the right to know. Pollution is never a good thing. I think if we can keep it as clean as possible, that's best for everyone. It's a lonely place, Fukushima. Most of the prefecture is deserted, including what used to be Naimi Town's elementary school. It stands as it did when the tsunami hit. Its principal wants it to stay this way. I want children to see the intensity, strength and the terror of the tsunamis, but I also want them to visit the school and see for themselves what we had to overcome to be where we are now. The children may be back soon. On March 31, Japan will lift some evacuation orders within the 20-kilometer exclusion zone around the Fukushima nuclear plant. It wants former residents to return and build lives there again, but many are not convinced. There are still a lot of people who evacuated, but for me I can't go back. I have my restaurant here, 
and I have a new home, and I have a new cemetery for my ancestors. I may visit once or twice a year, but I definitely can't live there again. This is why. Some streets are still littered with bags of radioactive waste, and radioactive boars are running wild. Still, some people have returned. If no one's here, everyone will be discouraged and say they can't do it. If they see someone trying, though, I think they will say to themselves, I'll try it out myself too. The town's mayor says in order for the place to survive, they need to push forward. We decided to restart the city, so we need to stick with it and work hard. Hard work is not the only thing needed. The area may also need time. Experts estimate the damaged nuclear plant will take another 40 years to dismantle. Nuclear disasters can have weird effects on animals, including making them thrive. That's the case with boars across Fukushima. The prefecture's radiation levels rose drastically in 2011 after an earthquake destroyed part of a nuclear power plant in the region. Because of this, many people from Fukushima moved out. But the radiation didn't stop boars from moving in. This is an issue because boars are known to attack humans and cause damage to local farmlands. A similar phenomena occurred after the Chernobyl disaster. It's speculated that animals move there because there's less of a chance humans will hunt them or ruin their habitat. As people look to return to their homes in Fukushima, many are hesitant to do so because of these boars. A recap of our breaking news story this hour. A second attack in Dusseldorf in less than 24 hours has left one person injured. Police say the suspect of today's incident is still at large. RT's Daniel Hawkins reports from the scene. Police have confirmed that there is uh, one casualty. That's an 80-year-old man who's been taken to hospital uh, with some sort of stab and cut wounds. He was attacked uh, in a car park with an as yet unidentified weapon. We initially heard reports of it being a machete. Uh, that has now been corrected uh, by police. Uh, he has been taken to hospital. As we say, his injuries uh, are not life-threatening at this stage. But there is a manhunt underway uh, with one suspect uh, confirmed so far. This is what the police have told us. We're conducting a manhunt at the moment. There's no indication that this latest attack is connected to yesterday's axe assault. Uh, now, uh, these two attacks obviously come uh, back to back in less than 24 hours. There's also been another attack in the city of Magdeburg where uh, it's alleged that two men attacked the occupant of a car uh, with weapons. They are also um, being hunted by police right now. So several incidents, uh, no confirmation uh, from police, no indication that they are related in any way and no confirmation yet that any of them are terror related. It's very important to stress that. But nevertheless, these are very worrying uh, incidents incidents and uh, we uh, heard earlier from one witness uh, who was at the scene of one of them. Because so many security staff started running out, I thought at first that something had gone off. I really thought my life was over. I simply collapsed. I couldn't breathe. I thought, what is this? I didn't realize what was going on. Even now, I still don't realize. I need a day or two for that. Thousands have gathered in Washington, D.C. today to protest the Dakota Access Pipeline. This comes after the Trump administration's decision to resume its construction back in January. The rally was spearheaded by Native American tribes who say their struggle is now more than just about the pipeline threatening their existence. They say it paints a broader picture of disrespect for the rights of the indigenous people in North America. Indigenous rights are under attack by this administration. They too can shut the charge against our native peoples by improving the Dakota Access Pipeline, Keystone Lake Pipeline. No consent! No pipeline! No consent! No pipeline! No consent!
chief of the Environmental Protection Agency, Scott Pruitt, said Thursday he does not believe carbon dioxide is a primary contributor to global warming. This is a statement at odds with most scientific consensus. Pruitt said measuring the effect of human activity on the climate is very challenging. He believes there's tremendous disagreement about the degree of impact of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. He stated, "I would not agree that carbon dioxide is a primary contributor to the global warming that we see." On Thursday, EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt said he believes Congress should weigh in on whether carbon dioxide is a detrimental pollutant that should be regulated. He also pledged to reduce regulatory uncertainty for U.S. industry. Pruitt further said the Trump administration will make an announcement on fuel efficiency standards for cars. He emphasized that he and Donald Trump believe current standards were rushed through. Trump campaigned on a vow to undo environmental regulations brought in by former President Barack Obama. This includes those intended to fight climate change. Trump's pledge was focused on boosting U.S. businesses, including the oil and gas drilling and coal mining productions. One of Australia's first and most influential climate change organizations announced this week that 12 years after its founding, it will be shutting down in June. John Connor, the CEO of the Climate Institute, claimed that after a major longtime donor discontinued its support, the Sydney, Australia-based organization failed to find sufficient backing to replace those funds. Connor suggested that the recent shift in political winds towards fossil fuels had left potential donors reluctant to back what they viewed as a losing battle. There's a new propaganda rap song for China's Communist Party. This time, it's about the six small issues President Xi Jinping is watching. The six issues include using clean energy for heating, waste sorting, livestock waste treatment, food safety, improving the quality of elderly care, and housing. The song, released by government-run Xinhua News Agency, came out during the Communist Party's annual legislative session. It's not the first time a rap song was used to get a party's message across. In the end of 2015, the state broadcaster CCTV released a rap song to celebrate achievements of a party organ. Earlier that year, Xinhua promoted a jaunty English-language theme song about the importance of the government's 13th five-year plan. Is Pope Francis signaling that he's open to the possibility of ordaining married men as priests? Well, the pontiff made comments to a German newspaper saying that while he prefers a celibate priesthood, married men of faith could be an asset to the church, especially in remote communities facing a shortage of priests. The Pope, however, did stop short of actually endorsing the idea. And Leland, you know, we've heard so many things from this Pope that are、uh, very new and different. Unbelievable. And so people start to hear these ideas and they think. Wow, this is a different conversation. Oh, it's a totally different conversation. I was in St. Peter's Square the night that he was elected pope,、mm -hmm. and people kept talking about how this is a new age of the、mm -hmm. Catholic、Very、Church.、Different. And I don't think anybody then even had an idea of how different things were going to be. Malaysia reported an outbreak of the bird flu virus. The World Health Organization for Animal Health said Wednesday, March 8th, that Malaysia's agriculture ministry reported an outbreak of H5N1. The report said the strain was confirmed among chickens at a backyard farm in the northeast Malaysian state of Kelantan. Government officials later confirmed the virus after testing samples. Malaysia's health minister said Thursday that the highly contagious virus was contained and there were no reported cases in humans. Eight people, including six laboratory workers, were reportedly exposed to the virus. They were placed under 24-hour quarantine. Agriculture Committee Chairman Datuk Che Abdul Ahmad said authorities are tracing the source of the outbreak. He assured the public that poultry from the region is safe for consumption. Channel News Asia said more than a thousand poultry birds were destroyed. The virus was also detected in Cambodia earlier last month.
The truth behind Zika is still not fully known. Although the topic of Zika calmed down after the Rio Olympics and Paralympics, scientists have still been busy studying the virus. The World Health Organization lifted the Public Health Emergency of International Concern designation for Zika November 2016. But according to Consumer Reports, between November 2016 and January 2017, some 4,000 new cases were reported in just the US and its territories and new risks are continuously being found. For instance, cited in Time, researchers found in a new report that Zika may also cause heart problems. The study's author, Dr. Karina Gonzalez Carter, said, quote, as days go by and more people are infected, we see different aspects of the virus. Carter goes on to say, quote, we need to create awareness. A new report is warning consumers that many conventionally grown fruits and vegetables are contaminated with pesticides but the report might actually do more harm than good. This is the Environmental Working Group Shopper's Guide to Pesticides in Produce. It ranks the best and worst produce when it comes to pesticide content. For the second year in a row, strawberries top the bad part of the list, also known as the dirty dozen. The nonprofit says just one sample of conventionally grown strawberries showed 20 different pesticides, and the other dirty dozen fruits and veggies didn't do too hot either. According to the report, more than 98% of samples of spinach, peaches, nectarines, cherries, and apples tested positive for at least one pesticide. The annual list is meant to convince shoppers to buy organic when it comes to certain types of produce. But critics say reports like these could be scaring people away from buying any fruits or vegetables. And at least one study has found the level of pesticides consumers are exposed to via the Dirty Dozen is negligible. For its part, the EWG emphasized in a statement that eating plenty of fruits and vegetables is essential, no matter how they're grown. On Friday, more than 100,000 customers remained without power in upstate New York. After fierce winds toppled power lines and damaged homes and businesses, they were told that some outages could last for days. As crews continued to access the damage, remove trees, and repair power lines after 70-mile-per-hour wind gusts blew through the area on Wednesday, utilities companies reported that nearly 127,000 customers were without power as of 1 a.m. local time. Power companies advised customers to plan for outages extending past the next 24 hours and in some areas for multiple days.